Um, thank you for your welcoming and warm applause just now. Um, it's good to get that straight away because I, I might not be very good. And um, <laughs> if, if, if I get anything above polite applause at the end, I'll consider that a bonus. Thank you. Um, I can tell you, we, look, we could really shorten this talk, you know, incredibly, and we could all go out for coffee early. Um, but um, when I talk about, when I think through my story, there's, there's one piece, I've managed to distill the wisdom that I've gained in, in really in one simple statement. And uh, I think if you walk away with this statement and you implement it in your life, it will cause you to feel fine peace, in a calm, to have warm relationships with your fellow human beings. It will improve societies and it may even bring about the cessation of war. Um, and, and the advice, uh, the piece of distilled wisdom is this. When you pick your nose, do it mindfully, otherwise it's a waste of good snot. <laughs> it's taken me years to get to that, that realisation. I like to think the Buddha would be impressed. <laughs> But seriously, I'm going to tell you a brain story and it's about my recovery from stroke and trauma and how I did that. And in that recovery, I came across many other inspiring stories, either in books or telling stories or online. And I got so much inspiration from that. And one of the motivations for writing my book and talking about my story is in the hope that that might inspire others as well. None of our particular journeys and our individual circumstances are the same but it's been surprising to me how many people relate to aspects of my story and they say, you are talking about me. Well, of course I wasn't, but um, it's, it's lovely to get that sort of feedback. So I hope that some of what I might say might reverberate in your lives or in the lives of those that you care about. Um, but underneath the brain story, the real theme is this, and that is compassion. The thing I discovered was compassion and I discovered the healing power of compassion. And I even thank compassion for saving my life. And I'll come back to that last theme at the very end. But uh, I was uh, a clinical and forensic psychologist and been working in that career for 20 years. And I'd seen the most awful things. I'd worked in the prison system. I'd done a lot of debriefing after natural disasters and suicides and murders and that sort of stuff and I'd seen a whole range of clients. And towards the end in my private practice the last five years, I was doing a lot of work for the children's court where families had had their children removed because of awful circumstances. And I would imagine my three daughters sometimes going through those circumstances and I would be traumatising myself, imagining what it would be like, not just for the kids that were going through that, these, those innocent faces looking up at me, not knowing what sort of future they had but I'd also imagine my own daughters going through that. And so I was traumatising myself, I now realise that. And after 20 years, I couldn't continue. I was experiencing nightmares, sleep disturbances, irritability, fits of anger. I couldn't understand what was going on and I sought help from a clinical psychologist who I respected in the area of trauma saying, I think I've been traumatised, but you know, I've been threatened a few times, but not enough to feel this way. And he said, you've got post-traumatic stress disorder and major depression. So I closed my practice thinking I'd be off for six months, get well again. I had a lot of physical aches and pains, often goes with some mental health condition. Uh, and two years down the track after that, I was starting to feel much, much better. So we're talking about the beginning of 2006 and into 2008. And I was getting much, much better thinking, mm, maybe I could even go back to work. But then the global financial crisis hit and I hadn't been earning any income for quite a long time. So we were knocked for a six and then we had creditors pounding us and just heartless the way they treated us, even though clearly we were a genuine case of financial hardship. And that stirred up the trauma symptoms again. And not long after that, out of the blue, I had a stroke. And it was a left-sided stroke. It knocked out a quarter of my, my vision. It also went down into the left temporal lobe so I lost a lot of memory, mainly memory for facts, mainly names and things, uh, things that you need to learn over time. But I'll come back to that in a minute. <clears throat> the important thing was that um, at that time, 
I was taken to hospital, suffering amnesia. I didn't even know I was the patient when my wife rushed me to hospital. It happened during the night. And they misdiagnosed me. They did a CT scan and some blood tests. They ignored some of the clinical signs. And they misdiagnosed me and sent me off to a psychiatric hospital. And so for three weeks, until a brain MRI was done, which should have been done at the very beginning, I believed I'd had a total and utter nervous breakdown. And the first night in that psychiatric hospital was awful because I was looking back at my life and I couldn't find a single thing that I felt good about. I felt I'd failed as a father, I'd failed my children, I'd failed my wife, I'd failed all the clients that I'd helped, I'd failed being a breadwinner, and here I was in a psychiatric hospital just because I couldn't find anything good about what I'd done. And the only thing I had with me was my guitar. That was the only thing left that I thought that I could get some succor from and that I could use to help me. So after that awful night and then the brain MRI confirmed that I'd had a stroke, of course then I had something I could work with. So it was a huge relief actually to have a diagnosis of a stroke. I went, whoopee! <laughs> stroke! <laughs> I'm lucky! But then, of course, uh, you know, all the deficits that, that come along with a brain injury started to show itself. And it took me about 15 months to work out all the things I couldn't, couldn't do like before. And there were things like having an ordinary conversation. So some would ask me something. The worst question was, how are you going? What an open-ended question is that? They'd ask me, how are you going? And I couldn't even remember if I'd seen this person before. And if I had, what had I told them? And then halfway through saying, well, I've had this test. And then I think, oh, um, what was the question? So conversations were almost impossible. My wife would ask me, what would you like for dinner? Seems a simple question, but the hardest question, what is dinner? Oh, that's the evening meal that we have. Oh, what sort of meals do we have for dinner? It's like rustling through an old filing cabinet. Hmm, all these things. Oh, but what do I like? Oh. oh, and then I've got to translate it back to her. It was like talking English as a second language. It was really, really clunky. And of course, she and others would get frustrated with me, so that made it even worse. So there were lots of things that I couldn't do. My vision was a problem, but because we lived in the country, the ophthalmologist said, you're OK to drive because we don't have street lights up there. <laughs> But unfortunately, I drove to Brisbane one morning <laughs> and I was fatigued, as I often was, because I had to sleep a lot during the day. And I missed a red light and almost sideswiped this elderly guy. And we were both shaking because it was a near miss. Uh, but other than that, the vision wasn't a big deal. And it's come right back now. It's back to normal. But what I worked out was that the problem was with my auditory processing, my ability to hold conversations. So this is the brain story now. I worked out that I needed to do brain retraining and I've used a program called Brain Fitness, that's now called Brain HQ, specifically to work on my auditory processing. And over the period of six weeks, I started to notice some real improvements. This fog was starting to lift, to lift and conversations were becoming clearer. I was starting to remember what people said. Then the other thing I needed to really address was this sort of comfortable misery that I was in. How was it I was becoming comfortable with this idea of just being miserable and playing this sick role? And I thought, well, I can exist. My insurance company was paying me an income. And I thought, well, I could exist as this really hollow person and get through life like this. And I imagine, you know, going through the rest of my life like this. But after a few months, I thought, no, this is not good. I want joy again. I want exhilaration again. And I want the people around me, my family, my friends, to also experience me as joyful, as a happy person. And so my compassion for them, as well as for my own suffering, motivated me to do stuff. And that's when I did the auditory retraining. And then I, started, then I contacted an, an old colleague of mine, a psychologist who was now working in a research unit, and I said, well, I'd like to do something useful as a volunteer. And he said, sure, and we had a meeting, and he ran through a number of things that I could possibly help him with. But the only one that really interested me was when he said, look, I'm interested in neuroscience and how you can apply that to psychotherapy. Yes, I said, that's what I want to do. And so we embarked on a series of readings. He told me what to read. 
I went home. Once a month we caught up and discussed our findings. But I've got to tell you, that was the hardest thing to read because I would read one page of this professional book and there were a lot of long words in that book. I would read one page and I would just about get the concept or the idea of the page. Then I'd read the next page and I could get that concept, but this one had completely gone. So I had to develop a strategy, whereas when I read one page, anything that stuck out for me, I wrote that down. Next page, I wrote any major points there, and so on. And so gradually, with the books and papers that I read, I developed a narrative about how the brain works. And then I could start to see how my brain was working and not working. And one of the major findings was, for me, was that I'm simplifying this stuff, is that the prefrontal cortex is vital to get the brain active again, particularly with depression and anxiety and trauma, but also this ability to make sense of the life that we're leading. And the right prefrontal cortex becomes more overactive in states like depression and anxiety. And the prefrontal cortex is that nerdish bump that we've got at the front here, um, which distinguishes from the, us from the other primates like the gorillas and chimpanzees. And it's the one that allows us to reflect on our experience and to make sense of them. So I got the left prefrontal cortex working by doing narrative writing, writing about my experiences, connecting them, trying to understand why I got into this state. And I realised that when I did that, I wasn't to blame for most of the things that happened to me. Most of the things that happened to me were bad things happening to a good person. So then my self-blame started to lift. And then I did other things like uh, mindfulness meditation, mindfulness and meditation, because I learned that that strengthened the prefrontal cortex control over the limbic system or the emotional centre of the brain. So then I started to notice the beginnings of any sensation in my body or in my mind. It was like I was watching them off in a distance and I could see them coming. And so then I could decide how I wanted to respond rather than just reactive, just being reactive. And so then I noticed that my emotional control was getting much, much better. And then finally I, I found that things like any activity that does, uses multiple parts of the brain at the same time, like dancing, like learning a new language, and like music making, um, get all the different brain parts talking again. And that is a healing process. So for me that was music making. Now I want to tell you um, that compassion was necessary for my recovery because I couldn't have done it on my own. Compassion was what motivated me to get well, but I needed compassionate people along the way. And because my energy was so fragile, I was feeling so small and not assertive, I had to just seek out people that when I was with them, I felt better for being with them. And it was as if our energy fields were interacting. And so I avoided those people that made me feel worse. And I had to dump a few health professionals because after the sessions with them, I felt worse. And also discovered there were a lot of non-experts that were really helpful. And that was serendipitous how I came across them. And one of them was a Buddhist nun who I ended, ended up spend, spending two weeks with. And I noticed how she was with her community that would come and visit her in her home. And it was this sort of acceptance. It was sort of a tough love. It wasn't necessarily touchy-feely thing. But it was like being with people, being with their pain, being with their distress, not being afraid of it. And in her presence, I just felt a warm acceptance. And I felt I could just be how I was, as damaged as I was. And she also, when I was with her, gained some important insights about my stroke experience. But you'll have to read about those in the book. <laughs> <coughs> So these compassionate people were absolutely necessary. I couldn't have gone along without meeting these people along the way and several of those people are still in my life today. I want to finish off with a, a song. I said that, I said that um, uh, compassion saved my life and I do literally mean that. Um, when I was uh, in, in the darkest pit, one of the things that... Um, would happen and there was about five times when I got very very strong suicidal thoughts and this had never occurred in my life before I thought you know this wasn't the sort of thing that would happen to me and those times were when I would just feel completely hopeless the pain the efforting the efforting every day every day um, was just getting too much 
And I thought, well, if I was to end my life and I would start thinking about how I would do that, I would think of the pain and the, and, and the suffering on those people left behind because I knew that the death of the child and suicide was the worst thing for those people left behind to handle. And I didn't want to inflict that on anyone else. Just need to, can we put this down? And um, when I was really, there was a couple of times when it was really, really bad and I had to almost hold onto the furniture to stop me from, from going out and doing anything. And at that time, I would think coming to my mind would be my daughter's faces, the three, the three, three faces of my daughters. And uh, I, there was two things. One is that I didn't want to inflict any pain on them. I didn't want them asking, why, Dad, why did you do it? And I didn't want them to grow up without a father, without the guidance of a father. And now as awful and as negative as that experience may sound, that's actually been gold for me. Because it's made me realise that the things that I most value are love and compassion. Obviously for my daughters, but more generally. And it's my relationships with people that I value the most now. And I feel very, very wealthy because of that. So I'm still drawing on this experience. <laughs> Some of these days I don't know if I can Keep going on and on And on and on and on But then I think of what I've got to lose And who I will let down If I don't people laughing or people feel that person's mind is something wrong. <laughs> now this word connections is a really interesting one because our kids today are more connected than ever. Of course then when you're in, a, in an institution people call you up <laughs> they tell you to perk up. Yeah perk up because I didn't think of that. I should have a happiness project I decided. As soon as I have some free time I'm going to do that. <laughs> 